Half a day and welcome. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice and Culture is now called to order. Today is Wednesday, June 22, 2022, and the time is 9.07 a.m. In compliance with the Open Government Law, notices for this public hearing were published in the Guam Daily Post on Wednesday, June 15th, and again on Monday, June 20th, 2022, and posted to the Government of Guam Public Notice Portal and live streamed via the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. Notices were also disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets. I'd like to recognize my colleagues who are here with us today. Our Legislative Secretary, Senator Amanda Shelton. Our Majority Leader, Senator Talina Nelson. Our Minority Leader, Senator Chris Duenas. Senator Anthony Adda. Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you, colleagues, for being here this morning. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and begin by stating their name for record keeping purposes. We have one agenda item for this 9 a.m. hearing, and that is Bill number 264 36 COR. It's introduced by the Committee on Air, Transportation, Parks, Tourism, Higher Education, and the Advancement of Women, Youth, and Senior Citizens by request of the Congressman Manhobin Guahan, the Guam Youth Congress, in accordance with 2 GCA 7102. It's an act to add a new Chapter 93 to Title IX Guam Code annotated relative to providing family members of an individual who, fear, who they fear is a danger to himself, herself, or others, new tools to prevent gun violence, and to cite this act as the Gun Violence Prevention Order Act of 2021. So the sponsor of the bill uh, the bill is introduced again by the Committee on Youth, but the original sponsor is at the request, it's at the request of the Congressman Manhobin Guahan. The representative of the Congressman Manhobin Guahan is not able to make it this morning, so I'm going to invite the uh, Committee on Youth Chairperson, Senator Shelton, to please read the statement on behalf of the Congressman Manhobin. Senator. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker, good morning to our colleagues and to the public. I'd like to also welcome all of our youth interns who are here in the legislature joining us from the Department of Youth Affairs Summer Internship Program. Uh, welcome, all of you. We're happy to have you here. And thank you very much, Madam Chair, for hearing Bill Number 264-36 introduced by the Committee on Air Transportation, Parks, Tourism, Higher Education, and the Advancement of Women, Youth, and Senior Citizens by requ request of the Congressman Manhobin Guahan and the Guam Youth Congress in accordance with 2 GCA Section 7102. Bill number 264-36 is the Gun Violence Prevention Order Act of 2021 and it seeks to add preemptive measures necessary in combating future gun violence and providing family members a method of depriving the right to purchase, receive, own, or otherwise possess a firearm from individuals who they believe possess a danger to himself, herself, or others by adding a new chapter 93 to Title IX GCA. This act will establish a gun violence prevention order and warrant law allow the Office of Attorney General to maintain and computerize database of all gun violence protection orders issued by the Supreme Court, and allow the Guam Police Department to establish a procedure that requires a law enforcement officer to, in conjunction with performing a wellness check on an individual, check whether the individual is listed on the firearm database or registry of Guam. And Madam Speaker, uh, this, this bill went through the process of the Youth Congress, was passed by our youth policymaking body uh, as a, a measure to address the rising concerns of gun violence uh, in our community, but in our wider uh, national community that we've seen uh, with the very tragic cases uh, that we know uh, with help and prevention and preemptive measures uh, may have been uh, prevented may have been avoided to keep the loss of so many innocent children and people in our community. And uh, those are experiences that uh, may seem far away from our people here on island, but we'd like to prevent from ever uh, happening again in our community. And so, Madam Speaker, I thank you today for hearing this bill and for the Guam Youth Congress for their 
uh, courage and their uh, foresight to introduce and pass such a measure to keep our community safe and to especially keep uh, our children and, and innocent people in our community uh, safe from this type of harm. Sidhu Osmasi. Sidhu Osmasi, Senator Shelton. Also like to welcome uh, Senator James Moylan, who's also here, and also um, the interns from the Attorney General's office, and uh, thank, welcome, and they're here to observe today's hearing together with other representatives from the Attorney General's office. For the record, the committee's invited uh, requ and requested feedback on Bill 264-36-COR from the Judiciary of Guam, the Office of the Attorney General, the Public Defender Service Corporation, the Guam Police Department, the Guam Bar Association, Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. We have received a, re a response from the Attorney General's office indicating that um, half a day speaker. We won't be able to attend this morning's hearing, but we'll submit what we can in response to your requests. Regarding Bill 264, we are in full support of efforts to prevent gun violence in our community. We haven't been able to complete an analysis of the fiscal impact of the bill in its current form on our budget, but we do recognize, as did JOG in its fiscal note on this bill, that as in most cases, added mandates are expectedly associated with added costs. If we're able to determine a specific fiscal impact, we can provide that to the committee before the closing date for testimony. Substantively, we note that last summer, the DOJ, Department of Justice, issued model legislation for extreme risk protection orders, including its commentary. We hope this info will be helpful to the committee and the legal bureau as this bill proceeds through the legislative process. We've CC'd Senator Shelton here as the chair of the sponsoring committee. Our office also provided this info to the Guam Youth Congress Vice Speaker LeBang, Sidious Masi Division of General Counsel, Office of the Attorney General of Guam. So they've attached uh, the Department of Justice model legislation and uh, also gave a link. That's from the Attorney General of Guam's office. We also um, have a response from the Supreme Court of Guam that says, thank you for your letter dated June 15 with an invitation to provide testimony. I met with the Judiciary's Administration to discuss the proposed bills. The Administration is currently in the process of vetting the proposed bills. I plan to meet with the Superior Court judges for comment and input on the bills. Written testimony will be provided within 10 days following the public hearing. Sinceramente, F. Philip Carbogito, Chief Justice. We also have written testimony, and all these written testimonies have been provided to all senators and, and are available. Uh, the other written testimony is from Attorney An Anthony R. Camacho. He writes, good morning, Chairperson Terlai and members of the committee. It's a privilege to come before you today. I'm here to oppose the passage of Bill Number 264, which is also known as the Gun Violence Prevention Order Act of 2021. As will be shown below, the bill should not be passed because it is duplicative, unnecessary, and because it diminishes the constitutional and organic act rights of Guam's firearm owners. The bill's duplicative because the person it seeks to protect already have sufficient access to the courts to obtain a protective order expeditiously pursuant to 7 GCA 40101 at sequence. Said protective order can include the temporary removal of firearms from the residence or the temporary suspension of the respondent's Guam firearms identification card if the court deems such actions are necessary to protect the complainant from further abuse or threats. Additionally, the class of persons who may apply for an order of protection are greater than those contemplated by the bill, which limits the persons who can apply for an order to confiscate a respondent's firearms to the respondent's spouse, spouse, child, parent, 
legal guardian, sibling, grandchild, or grandparent. Finally, protective orders issued pursuant to 7 GCA 40101 must be recorded in Guam's Registry for Protection, which is maintained by the Superior Court of Guam, and the information contained in the registry is available at all times to a court, a law enforcement agency, and other governmental agencies upon request. Therefore, persons who may be threatened by their household members who may have firearms already have strong, available, and expeditious access to the courts to obtain a protective order, which may include the removal of the respondent's firearms from the home or the temporary suspension of the respondent's Guam firearms identification card. And by voting against the passage of Bill 264, the Guam legislature will avoid the cost of developing and maintaining a separate database for firearm confiscation orders, which would be required by Bill 264. Passage of Bill 264 is unnecessary because firearm violence on Guam is very low. Specifically, Guam's overall rate of violent crime, inclusive of murder, is approximately 6.32 persons per million people. In comparison for the rest of the United States, it is approximately 42.01 persons per million people, which is seven times higher than Guam. In 2017, it was estimated that there were approximately 20,000 privately owned firearms on Guam. Just two years later, in 2019, the seven murders reported that year, only two of these murders were committed with a firearm. Hence, the use of firearms on Guam to commit violent crimes remains low, which indicates that the passage of Bill 264 is unnecessary. If the bill is duplicative and unnecessary, what were the bill's author's motivation for creating it? That is easily answered by a careful review of the text of the bill, which strongly indicates that it is meant to diminish the constitutional and organic act rights of some of Guam's citizens for the simple reason that they own a firearm. Currently, if a person seeks to obtain a protective order against a respondent, they must prove that the respondent abused or threatened to abuse them by a preponderance of the evidence. In contrast, Bill 264 has a much lower threshold to confiscate a person's firearms, which is reasonable suspicion. Hence, this lower evidentiary standard, which specifically targets firearm owners, makes it very likely that the real motivation of the bill's author was firearm confiscation instead of any real concern for the prevention of firearm violence. Further, due to the fact that violent firearms crimes on Guam are very low, the, excuse me, would not justify the bill's lower evidentiary standard if the bill is enacted into law and a court were to test So we lost internet service on, on the YouTube, our, our link, so we're going to hold until that is restored. Apparently the TV is still on. Thank you. Thank you. We're back uh, on with our YouTube connection. So I was reading testimony from Anthony R. Camacho, Esquire. Attorney Camacho wrote to the committee in opposition of the bill. I'm going to summarize the pages that I had already read. Uh, 
the bill is duplicative because the person it seeks to protect already have sufficient access to the courts to obtain a protective order expeditiously pursuant to 7 GCA 40101. And he describes that protection. Passage of bill number 264 is unnecessary because firearm violence on Guam is very low. And so he describes the, that Guam's overall rate of violent crime, inclusive of murder, is approximately 6.32 persons per million, compared to the rest of the United States, which is 42.01 persons per million people, seven times higher than on Guam. In 2017, there were approximately 20,000 privately owned firearms on Guam. Two years later, in 2019, seven murders reported that year. Only two were committed with a firearm. Hence, the use of firearms on Guam to commit violent crimes remains low, which indicates that the passage of Bill 264 is unnecessary. And this is where we got cut off. <clears throat> if the bill is duplicative and unnecessary, what were the bill's authors' motivation for creating it? That is easily answered by a careful review of the text of the bill, which strongly indicates that it is meant to diminish the constitutional and organic act rights of Guam citizens for the simple reason that they own a firearm. <clears throat> Currently, if a person seeks to obtain a protective order against the respondent, they must prove that the respondent abused or threatened to abuse them by a preponderance of the evidence. In contrast, Bill 264 has a much lower threshold to confiscate a person's firearms, which is reasonable suspicion. Hence, this lower evidentiary standard, which specifically targets firearm owners, makes it very likely that the real motivation of the bill's authors was firearms confiscation instead of any real concern for the prevention of firearm violence. Further, due to the fact that violent firearms crimes on Guam are very low and will not justify the bill's lower evidentiary standard, if the bill is enacted into law and a court were to test its constitutionality by applying a strict scrutiny standard, it is likely that a court would find the lower evidentiary standard to be a violation of the firearm owner's right to equal protection under the law. Therefore, the bill diminishes the Constitutional and Organic Act rights of Guam's firearm owners. Accordingly, I oppose a passage of Bill 264 because it is duplicative, unnecessary, and because it diminishes the Constitutional and Organic Act rights of Guam's firearm owners. Submitted this 21st day of June 2022 by Anthony Arcamancho Esquire with his address. And the, and the um, senator has read the statement of the sponsor of the bill, which is Vice Speaker Al Edrich LeBang of the 33rd Guam Youth Congress. And uh, we have a fiscal note from BBMR, which indicates that per correspondence with the judiciary of Guam, it is difficult to determine the full fiscal impact that the judiciary would experience without an estimated number of anticipated requests for the prevention orders and or warrants contemplated to be issued under this bill's provisions. The judiciary stated that enactment of this bill may create an additional workload for the current judicial officers and their respective staff. Dependent on the number of anticipated cases, the judiciary may need additional personnel to process and adjudicate such matters. As such, the judiciary estimates a minimum cost impact of 199085 111000 for salaries, 72000 for benefits, and 15000 for operational costs. The Office of Attorney General will also be impacted by this bill, but there is no fiscal impact estimation from their office. That is from the fiscal note that the committee received from the Bureau, BBMR, which is the Bureau of Budget and Management Resources. All right, so there, are, there is uh, no one else here to present testimony, but I would open it up to my colleagues if they have any questions or comments. Shelton. All right. Uh, Senator Duenas. To do responsibly, Madam Chair, and um, I think for the benefit of our young folks here, here today to join us and kind of engage and learn this process, um, unfortunately today we don't have 
individuals testifying, but I want to provide some comments so that maybe um, you can get an idea of the back and forth that happens within this legislative hall. As you can see, the Speaker of the Youth Congress has written a very lengthy and informative testimony. But then you also can see where another attorney, esteemed attorney who is, um, of course, uh, certified by the bar, Mr. Camacho, to do, um, you know, to, to uh, provide, uh, or to be a lawyer and to uh, be an officer of the court. And he provides a very different perspective, one that I will say I'm willing to go on the record and say I agree with. I think it is important when we have legislation such as this um, and a matter that is this serious, because it is very serious, and I certainly can respect the reason for the introduction or the discussion of the bill from the Youth Congress. But I think uh, not just this public hearing should happen on this issue. I believe we should move uh, on this bill uh, with further um, hearings, what we normally call in the legislative hall here, round tables. And that is to bring more individuals to the table to discuss this issue and to debate kind of the veracity of the need for this at this time, particularly in Guam. For the benefit of the youth that have joined us, Guam has some of the most strict gun laws in the entire nation. I would dare say more than likely, more strict than every single state or other territory. And uh, the need to register firearms, to, to have um, all of the licensure and everything else required to, to carry a firearm and background checks and all the other things that go into place um, you know, uh, are very, very extremely strict. Um, fortunately, and we hope it stays this way, we do have, as Attorney Camacho points out, a very uh, low incidences of gun violence on Guam, thank God, and we pray that that continues to be the case. As I close my perspective on this, like I said, I'd love to see some more uh, work done here where we have individuals like Attorney Camacho and other that would come forward and of course, you know, those who are proponents of the bill to come forward and discuss it further uh, to kind of, um, you know, determine what is the balanced perspective on this issue. I will say that it's really important to know and understand that very, very few times, in fact, almost never, does a law-abiding, trained individual who owns a firearm for protection of their property and their family commit crimes with those firearms. Law-abiding citizens who possess firearms to protect their family and to protect their property, they're more than likely protecting themselves from criminals. People who, for whatever reason, have decided to use whatever means, whether it be a firearm, a knife, a machete, a pipe, any type of device that they could commit violence with for the purposes of all kinds of nefarious reasons. It could be to rob you. It could be to steal your property. It could be because they have an addiction problem. And instead of us handling and concentrating on those problems as well as mental defect, they end up in society and they end up being out there um, having the ability to take what belongs to you and sometimes maybe even the most precious thing that you have, which is an, another loved one, a child, a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandfather, somebody who you love. So law-abiding citizens who avail themselves of the training and all of the requirements needing to have a firearm because they've decided that they need that to protect their life and their property and most especially their family, are not individuals who under most, if not all, circumstances would use firearms for this reason. In closing, I know that, and this is tough, but I think it's important to hear tough stuff. I, I don't know if you watch national programming in terms of getting your news information and the like, and there's an opportunity to see balance. You can go to CNN and see a very liberal point of view. You can go to Fox News and see a very, very conservative point of view. 
But one of the things that's being discussed today, particularly on Fox News, and has been for the last couple of days, is a very painful situation where it looks like there was an ability to really curtail what happened in Ovalde at that school, that horrific situation that none of us ever want to see happen for all the rest of the days of our life. But it turns out that there was a severe breakdown in so many issues in the chain of how safety and security can be provided to protect our children, most especially in an environment such as going to school and trying to learn to better their lives. So I wanted to provide this opportunity to discuss this pro and con on this issue so that you hopefully will take away from this process exactly what this is all about and what happens here. I'm sure we'll continue to debate this issue, but I wanted to provide my perspective today where having to make a decision on how I feel about this bill at this time, I'm going to place my position as agreeing with Attorney Camacho that um, our laws are strict, our laws are strong, and if the need for this bill to become law uh, may eventually uh, be something in the future, it should require more deliberation, more debate, and more facts to balance what the issue is presented before us. So Madam Speaker, with that, I just wanted to provide that opportunity uh, while we had the audience here of our young people to get a taste of what happens here uh, in the eventuality that this bill would either have further hearings or even if it made it to the floor, I would envision that this would be the debate. Sejus Masi, Madam Speaker. Sejus Masi, Senator. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I do have some concerns that the Office of the Attorney General is not here to help uh, or to assist in this, in this matter. Uh, we do have the testimony from uh, Attorney Camacho, Anthony Camacho, and um, I appreciate his testimony. Uh, just to reiterate uh, some of the same concerns that Guam does have one of the strictest firearms policy. And the recent incident in Paseo that occurred happened with an individual who was not authorized to carry a firearm. And mostly, those that do have firearms um, identification cards, they are experienced personnel with how to, uh, op with how to operate a firearm, uh, understand the necessity and the purpose of the firearm. And so, Really, the challenge here is to, to get the Office of the Attorney General to opine on the matter, and perhaps we can have a roundtable hearing to discuss this further. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Senator Adda. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, Madam Chair. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, I'm not going to reiterate what they have said. Uh, perhaps what needs to happen is that we continue to have roundtable discussions and this bill remains in committee until we have a second public hearing where the Office of the Attorney General, the Superior Court of Guam, uh, also Guam Police Department. We haven't heard any testimony from Guam Police Department. And uh, the community at large, I believe that when we have the community's input, uh, it makes the process uh, more informative as to how we debate on this legislation when it goes to the floor. I'm surprised with the, the absence of all the law enforcement agencies and, and our, our judiciary not being here on this important piece of legislation. And I hope that, Madam Speaker, that you'll be able to schedule several roundtables and an additional public hearing prior to this bill being uh, even uh, reported out of our committee. Uh, for discussion on the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I echo the concerns and issues raised by our colleagues with regards to this bill. I think we can all understand the importance of wanting to ensure safety of our community. And we repeatedly, I mean, it's almost a weekly event, certainly nationally in the United States, to see continued gun violence and certainly what we see when we have these mass shootings, uh, it's very disturbing. I mean, you know, we want to think we're a progressive, part of a progressive nation, and yet worldwide, uh, the United States leads this type of violence on a regular basis. But I also agree that because of the significance of this, and it's how do we define and how do we create a balance between what our rights are, uh, 
and what our rights are now to, to hold and possess a weapon versus individuals in our community, unfortunately, for whatever reason that um, might be mental, I don't know. Um, but, you know, can so easily bring harm upon people. I've always thought about that in the Guam legislature, the times and the years I've been here, because it's so easy to access the public hearing room, as it should be. We should be open to our people. Uh, but I fear as the years go on that we're going to end up being in a situation where we're probably going to have to have scanners probably at the entrance of every public facility, probably at every school, uh, because of this type of abuse and fear. I mean, can you imagine taking your children to school not knowing if they're going to be safe or anyone or any gathering in a public place where someone, for whatever reason, uh, takes out a weapon and uses it against innocent people that have no way whatsoever protecting or defending themselves. Um, this bill does require further discussion because I, I think there's an issue we need to determine. And also, every time we do legislation, do we have the resources to implement it? Um, right now, with protective orders, and I've heard from members of our community who've had protective orders. I mean, this is about preven prevention orders is how it's defined. But we've had individuals in our, our our community that have protective orders because of violence against them in the past. And their frustration with the system in terms of how responsive our government is um, when a, an individual, an innocent member of our community is offended by someone and re-offended by someone and the ability to respond. And sometimes those cases, particularly domestic cases, have ended up in violence and sometimes death. I don't know anyone here who doesn't know someone who's been in that situation. Uh, but how do we address a fine line? And that's the big question. I think we all want to be safe. I mean, I feel far less safe in this island than I ever have my entire life for most of the years of my life that I've lived here. And a lot of people in our community feel that way. A lot of good law-abiding citizens in this community do not feel safe. And police can't be everywhere. You know, there's no infinite amount of money that's going to be able to pay for everything. Um, when you can't and sometimes don't know what goes on in someone's mind. Our movies, our televisions, our books, everything we read, there's so much violence in it. I'm at a time and age in my life when I'm channel flipping because I'm tired of looking at, at programs that involve extreme violence and murder, and that's the whole course of watching. I used to like watching Law and Order. I don't like watching it anymore. How many more times am I gonna see how a human being can be killed, manipulated, abused? So that's the challenge that we have, but I definitely agree, Madam Speaker, because of the intent of this bill, and I certainly appreciate our, our young leaders in the community for bringing this issue forth, uh, but we definitely need to have more engagement and discussion with the key law enforcement officials, including the Attorney General's office. I appreciate written testimony, but I can't question and engage with written testimony the same way we can uh, of having these individuals in an open forum be able to have these questions and answers and, and the back and forth that I think is necessary to actually properly vet this legislation before we move forward. Um, I also want to rely, I know Senator Tello had similar concerns. She's apologizes she's not here. She's under the weather today, uh, but she's certainly uh, watching this hearing and the proceedings. So with that, Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this bill. Thank you, Senator. Senator Moylan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the uh, youth that are participating and coming up with some ideas and looking at ways we can help protect our island, our, our residents, and the youth. I think this issue is more of a behavioral health issue that our society is facing, and we need to address on our island how we can do this on Guam. It's a good discussion to have, and uh, at the end, we really just want to protect our residents at, at this time. And, it's best we continue this discussion and that I feel the bill should remain in committee until we have further discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And so for those who are here, um, we've got youth interns here participating by uh, attending the hearing and watching. And for those who are watching at home, so of course we did not read the entire bill. So its provisions you will have to read for yourselves. They're available online on the Guam Legislature's website. So while when we come here, we assume that all the senators have read the bill, they have copies in front of them, and so we just get right away into discussing the provisions without really fully reading them, right? Um, but I'm hoping that you were able to guess at least a, uh, enough about what the bill's doing is to establish a protective order, meaning you can go to court and get an injunction or, or stop somebody 
take away their gun temporarily what, if you believe that they are a threat. Now, that's really summarizing it, right? But that's kind of the gist of it. And uh, they are a threat, and that's for the courts to determine if they are a threat, um, uh, the allowed, um, well, the recognized, some of the recognized um, standards are, you know, mental illness. But um, as the Attorney General's office said in the written testimony, there is a uniform bill that was made by the De Feder U.S. Department of Justice. So that's a federal Department of Justice, and they made a uniform bill, meaning that is their recommendation as to if you want to enact legislation like this, this is their recommendation of how all the states should do it. They want that to be uniform across the states. So they call it the uniform bill. So, and as you've heard, my colleagues are, you know, asking for more input. Um, and, I w and I want you to note, so the process requires us to give notice, and so we give public notice, and that's really what's required. But our committee goes out of its way when we see a bill like this, and we know that it's going to have impacts on law enforcement, impacts on gun owners, impacts on behavioral health and wellness, all of those people who by the bill are mandated to play some role. So we go out of our way as a committee to notify them and invite them to be here today so that we can have the discussion that my colleagues are asking for, right? We want to be able to question and beyond what is put in writing a lot of times. And, um, and we have to weigh, of course, the pros and cons. And so I'm going to tell you the questions that I would have asked if, if they were here as well. And again, we invited, you know, the Attorney General's office, the judiciary, the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center, the entire Guam Bar Association, that's all the lawyers, <clears throat> if they had any input, the public defender who's representative for indigent uh, defense, and the Guam Police Department, which of course, they're the ones who control gun ownership on Guam. They're the ones who give you a gun licenses on Guam. So in addition to the fiscal impact, uh, we really wanted to know um, things, when we looked at the um, uniform law and compared it to this law, this bill, it's not the same. So we wanted to know from the sponsors why did their bill not include, for example, <clears throat> penalties that are recommended in the uniform law. Penalties for false claims, like I claim that, you know, somebody is a threat to me or made a threat to me, but if I make, and, and that allows the court to suspend their license to carry a gun, what is the penalty if I make that claim falsely, right? So this bill doesn't include that penalty and that's what we wanted to ask. That's a recommendation from the Department of Justice to include in such bills as penalties for false claims. The, um, but there are other states that have enacted bills like this. We, we count 19 US states and Washington DC as of June 2022 that are called um, gun violence protection orders or red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders. Some of the other jurisdictions, so here it's only family members who can make this claim and make this report in this bill. But in the other jurisdictions, they've allowed family members and educators, school staff, coworkers, law enforcement, almost all of them have law enforcement, and or medical and mental health professionals can also make those claims or those um, reports, right? Um, so this bill very limited to family members only, and we just wanted to um, you know, have a discussion about that. Why would that be more beneficial on Guam than including GPD, for example, and, and these other people that are mentioned educators. All right, and then the Department of Justice, uh, the time frames in the bill, the protection order will last for three years, but in other jurisdictions, the protection orders last from one 
sometimes five years. So it's all over the spectrum, and we just wanted to know how they decided on three years. We wanted to know, like, what attorney Camacho testified, is this duplicative? Did it, is, is that provision that he cites enough? And so we wanted to ask the other stakeholders, of course, if, if they agree that that's enough, because that's one opinion from one lawyer, and we wanted to ask, I wanted to ask GPD and, and the Attorney General's office if they agree that that's enough, that that protection order is fast enough, it's you know, wide enough to protect uh, those who might be at risk, as pointed out by this bill. I wanted to also ask about, in other jurisdictions, the only, well, you know, one of the issues that have been brought up by the police departments in those jurisdictions where they've enacted laws like this is that if they want the police to, in, to use their judgment as to whether there's a risk, then the police need to have additional training to do that. And so the bill doesn't mandate that training, and so I wanted to ask if that would be available to them or how we could make that available. And I wanted to ask Guam Behavioral Health if they would be able to make that training available to the Guam Police Department or if the police department has its own resources for that type of training. So the bill allows that upon review of the results of examinations, the superior court or magistrate may issue a gun violence order upon finding that there is a reasonable suspicion that possession of a firearm by the named individual poses a significant risk of personal injury to the named individual or others. Can this reasonable suspicion and issuance of a temporary gun violence protection order be made without a hearing prior to the issuance? So the reason why this bill, this type of law has been upheld in other jurisdictions as constitutional is because it, it supposedly has due process protections in those jurisdictions, meaning due process is you get to have a hearing before they take any of your rights away. And so because of the court hearings, and so that's what I'm asking is, if these hearings are going to be available to them, uh, because that is, I think, necessary, that due process protection before their rights are removed. And then, of course, I wanted to ask the GPD, Behavioral Health, Health and Wellness, whether they are able or who is best suited to conduct these wellness checks or to determine if there is reasonable suspicion that the, per, the individual poses a significant risk of injury, right? Who should make that determination? And then I wanted to know, if a petitioner came forward, a family member, and, you know, made this allegation about another family member, is that, and if it's true, is that person who's coming forward protected? Are they also, or is their name going to be published in the court proceedings, or are they protected, right? Um, from further risk, threat. And, and um, so those were some of the questions. I just want to share those with you so that you know, yeah, there are questions unanswered that we would like to know. And then we have to make a decision based on what is best for our jurisdiction. So we compare other jurisdictions to see what's available and what, how other jurisdictions treated the same type of questions and the same type of interests that they need to balance, and then um, we will have to make a decision. So right now that we've had a public hearing, um, again, we invited everybody. We can try to do it again, or we can move forward, right, with the committee report saying that um, this is where it lay, and we can see how the committee decides to vote on either this bill or an amended version of this bill. If I was to amend this bill, I'll tell you right now, I would look at the um, uniform bill recommended by the Department of Justice and, and try to make it as close to that as possible because I'm going to guess that that will withstand any kind of legal challenges more than, you know, departing from that uniform law. But um, that's why, you know, the more input we have, the better on these types of issues.
All right, but there being no further questions or comments from the panel, uh, Senator Shelton, would you like to close as a sponsor of the bill? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Again, thank you for hearing this bill. I just wanted to um, make a clarification that the statement that I uh, said at the beginning was my statement to introduce the bill and not the statement of the Guam Youth Congress, uh, but gave the facts of the bill. So again, thank you very much, and I look forward to um, the process the committee will carry out. Wait. Well, I'm sorry. I'd like to read the letter then of the Guam Youth Congress because he is the sponsor of the bill. Hold on. Oh, you're going to read it? Yeah, okay. So Senator Shelton will read the letter. I read the letters of the other testimony. I, I, I don't want to go without reading his testimony. So that is the vice speaker of the Guam Youth Congress, but this was a bill passed by the entire Guam Youth Congress, which is why it is before us today. June 21st, 2022, to Speaker Therese M. Terlahi, Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture, Mina Trentai Saisen Lahisatur and Gahan, regarding testimony in support of Bill 264-36 COR. Bonus and Hafidei, Speaker Terlahi and the members of the committee, I am Al Edrich LeBang, Vice Speaker of the 33rd Guam Youth Congress, and the Youth Congress sponsor of Bill 264-36 COR. Today we are faced with a bill that would allow gun protection orders for any individual. Just to address the elephant in the room, gun violence protection orders can be used as a tool to prevent violence and save lives. According to the United States Department of Justice, research has shown that states can save lives by authorizing courts to issue extreme risk protection orders, which in another term for gun protection orders temporarily preventing a person in crisis from accessing firearms. Law enforcement, healthcare providers, community leaders, victim advocates, and others may not help shape the appropriate scope of a state's particular legislation, but also be critical to ensuring that people in the community are aware of the process for petitioning for an ERPO. The Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence and the Everytown for Gun Safety Support Fund are both organizations that describe their mission as to save lives and reduce gun violence. The Giffords Law Center described extreme risk protection orders as life-saving tools that can prevent gun tragedies before they occur, and argued that the laws were being used to prevent mass shootings, suicides, terrorism, and other types of gun violence. The Every Town for Gun Safety Support Fund wrote on their website, when a person is in crisis, Loved ones in law enforcement are often the first to see the warning signs. ERPO laws empower family members in law enforcement to petition for an order that temporarily removes guns from a dangerous situation and reduces the risk of suicide. In response to arguments that extreme risk protection orders violate the right to due process, the Every Town for Gun Safety Support Fund pointed to provisions in extreme risk protection order laws allowing individuals subject to the order to appear in court for a full legal hearing. The Alliance for Gun Responsibility, a group that supported Initiative 1491, a 2016 ballot measure in Washington state, on whether courts should be authorized to issue extreme risk protection orders, argued that extreme risk protection orders included careful protections for due process and standards for evidence. Furthermore, the American Bar Association urges state, local, territorial, and tribal governments to enact statutes, rules, and regulations authorizing courts to issue gun violence restraining orders, including ex parte orders. Additionally, the John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health finds that many people who pose a risk of harming themselves or someone else with a firearm can legally possess guns and would pose a background and would pass a background check required to purchase a new gun. State laws often do not provide a clear legal mechanism to restrict access to guns before a tragedy occurs, 
even when it is clear that an individual is at risk of causing harm to self or others. An extreme risk protection order is a civil order with due process protections issued by a court when someone is at risk of violence to himself or others. Depending on the state's ERPO law, family members, dating partners, household members, law enforcement, healthcare professionals, coworkers, and school administrators may petition the court to temporarily restrict a person's access to firearms when he or she is behaving dangerously and at the risk of committing violence. Recent gun violence on the island has occurred within the past year, where a lifeless man was found in Swamp Road, Dedido, where a man used an unregistered pistol to kill another individual, the shooter, Matthew St. Augustine Manabusin, with prior records. Another incident involving a man on pretrial release, according to a magistrate's complaint, police responded to the Dedido skate park on April 27, 2021, for a complaint involving two cars. Benny Joshua Salas Nauta, 30, was the driver of a silver Toyota Corolla. A call to police reported seeing the same vehicle speeding through the village, trying to stop a car. The caller also reported hearing a gunshot. In the other car was the woman who said she was trying to leave to get groceries when she got into an argument with Nauta. Nauta then allegedly followed the victim, who also had three children in the car, and then got in front of the car at a nearby church. As the police apprehended Nauta, he stated that he did not have guns, but as he stepped out of the vehicle, he whispered where it was located. Nauta was charged with possession of a firearm without a firearm identification card as a third degree felony with notice of commission of felony while on felony release. Last July 14, 2021, a viral video that shows a man pointing a pellet rifle at cars that are passing through just here in Agatnya, Hagatnya. Imagine if that gun was a real gun. Madam Speaker and members of the committee, these instances are the reason why we should have a gun protection order on our island. Others may say that we should broaden this and include other weapons. I disagree with this statement because it diverts us away from the issue of gun control. By broadening the scope of this bill, it would make it not adhere to the standing rules, but would allow it to make a non one subject matter bill. And if you wish to include other weapons, I suggest that you create your own separate bill that addresses it. But let us not forget the horrific school mass shooting events in our nation's history. Columbine in 1999, Sandy Hook in 2012, the Stoneman Douglas in 2018. As a teacher, we must protect our school and our students. Students do not need to learn how to dodge a bullet with a fast average velocity of 2,350 feet per second, but rather learn the content that they are supposed to learn in school. As of April 2021, there have been 150 mass shootings that happened within 2021. And I agree with President Joe Biden, the gun violence in the United States is an epidemic that is becoming an international embarrassment. More recently, the Uvalde, Texas mass shooting last May 24, 2022, where an 18-year-old gunman went on a rampage shooting at the Robb Elementary School where it took the lives of 19 students, ages nine to 11 years old, and two teachers. Prior to the shooting incident, Salvador Ramos, the perpetrator, had shown signs of potential harm through po posting pictures of semi-automatic rifles on social media. The Gun Protection Order Act would allow for courts to temporarily seize a firearm from an individual who posed a threat to themselves or others. The bill sets up procedures that are necessary for gun protection orders to be issued. Additionally, it provides a due process for an individual to request a hearing to challenge such orders. Furthermore, the bill seeks to create a database of gun protection orders issued by the court. The purpose of this bill is to avoid mass shootings on the island and keep our community safe. As a teacher, it distraught me to see news of mass shootings that take place in schools where innocent lives are lost due to someone who possesses harm to themselves or others. As others may argue the bill infringes on our rights to bear arms, I feel that the Constitution is a living document that changes its meaning due to the unique challenges of time. As one of my fellow teachers teaches the students of our island in the picture attached below, it shows how the meaning of the Second Amendment changes over time. 
Senators, the Second Amendment, and I quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated means that we shall put regulations on gun ownership. Bill 264-36COR does not impede the Second Amendment rights on any individual. Even though gun violence data on our island is low at the moment, we shall do anything that we could to keep it low and prevent a more severe act of gun violence from taking place. Let us not deny that we have a gun control problem not only on our island, but the whole nation. Let us not find reason to divert from the passing of the Gun Protection Act of 2021. Siduas Maasi, this is Vice Speaker Aula Bang of the 33rd Guam Youth Congress. Thank you very much, Senator Shelton, for reading that. That's the letter by the sponsor of the bill in the Guam Youth Congress. Attached to his letter was also an um, illustration of a gun that was available, a gun in, on the date that the Second Amendment was passed and guns today. It was an illustration. I also wanted to point out, so I told you we, we look at what they, do, they have done in other states, but we are also impacted by what is done federally Right, gun control is a is a federal issue a lot of the time in, in a lot of ways. And so right now in, in uh, the Senate, in the U.S. Senate, they've released a compromise bill, meaning a compromise between the Republicans and the Democrats in regards to uh, legislation that is aimed at um, it, it's aimed at um, doing different things in regards to guns and making safety uh, and safety issues. But one of them, I'm gonna read part of it, it says it, that it will, it's an 80 page bill, would enhance background checks, give authorities 10 days to review juvenile mental health records of gun purchasers younger than 21, pour federal dollars into helping states implement so-called red flag laws. That's the type of law we're talking about today. So. And this, if the, this is passed in the Senate, they're going to put money to the states to implement these types of laws, which allow authorities to temporarily confiscate guns from people deemed dangerous. The measure would also, for the first time, ensure that serious dating partners are included in a federal law that bars domestic abusers from purchasing firearms. They also agreed to provide millions of dollars for expanding mental health resources in communities and schools, in addition, uh, funds devoted to boosting school safety. They would toughen penalties for those evading licensing requirements or making illegal straw purchases, buying and then selling weapons to people barred from purchasing handguns. So that's just a very quick, that's from the New York Times, so you can also look that article up. And so, but it's relevant because it looks like they if they are going to put funds towards implementing these types of laws in the states, in every state, then, then uh, that might also encourage us to implement that type of a law. Uh, anyway, so there being, uh, I wanna thank my colleagues for being here today and thank all of you in, in attendance today and there being no additional individuals to present testimony, the committee will consider bill number 264-36-COR duly heard. The public hearing is now adjourned. Testimony can be submitted up to 10 days. The time is now 10.06 a.m. Sijus Masi.